Um, okay, so my name's Lauren. Um, I work at this small little startup, uh, cloud services startup in Seattle. Um, we have some offices out here in Cape Town. I was here visiting, and um, uh, I got to visit everyone. I can't tell you our name, though, because we're in stealth mode. Um, I'm probably going to get in trouble for that with trademark. Um, so having worked on, at this company, having worked on Ruby code and other code over the years, I've had the chance to work on and with libraries of all shapes and sizes. And I want to share my experience um, using those libraries and writing those libraries um, in terms of how to deal with API stability and what that means and how not to break people and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about is sort of the lessons I've learned over the years. And a lot of it might sound like I have all the answers, but I don't. There's, there's a cost benefit associated with all these decisions, and um, your mileage may vary. So with that, let's go. Um, we're getting older as a community, uh, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but what does it mean to be a grown-up? The word that I associate with grown-up is responsibility. And um, that means that uh, there's, because there's a lot of code out there, there's a lot of stuff that can be broken. And responsibility to me means sort of this, this journey from being an idealist to a, a young little idealist to an older, more wiser pragmatist. And um, when I started doing Ruby, I was basically entranced by this beautiful Ruby, uh, beautiful idiomatic like English DSL style beauty stuff. Um, and I wanted to make my APIs perfect and everything. And um, I think over the years you sort of realize that um, now that you have, now that, now that we have code that depends on all these DSLs and they're, they're not perfect, um, we have the choice. Do we want to still be those idealists that just throws everything off the table and starts fresh? Or, or are we going to be more of a pragmatic kind of community that um, that can live with some imperfection. And that is to say that backwards compatibility matters. Um, but, but to whom does it matter? And so library maintainers live in this world where they see one dependency or two dependencies or maybe zero. And they live happily in this world, and I call this easy mode, um, because they don't really have to deal with many dependencies. They sort of live in this, and I'm one of them, and we sort of live in this uh, world where we have a distorted view of dependency management. And so it's easy for a library maintainer to say, oh, I'm going to break stuff now, but it's just one breaking change. You can deal with it. Um, but the reality is different for, for many other people. The reality is this is their world, and they have a lot more dependencies to deal with. And your library just fits in as one little piece of this puzzle. And so just for context, this is actually what dependencies look like, if you thought I was joking with that image. This is a sample gem file that I'll lock for just some sample file on uh, application on GitHub. And it has over 150 lines in that gem file that lock. So it has a lot, a lot of dependencies. And so you have uh, one library maintainer that says, OK, um, uh, just one breaking change. And another library maintainer that says, oh, just one breaking change. And eventually, you are broke. Um, so breaking changes hurt. And they, and they hurt a lot for developers. And this is basically why we have a gemfile.lock, is to sort of isolate ourselves from these breaking changes. And having a gemfile.lock is a good thing. And you should be isolating yourself from change, especially when you're deploying to production apps. But there's a side effect of being too afraid to update. And that is you fall behind, and you, and you have to spend a lot of dev cycles trying to keep up to date with all these changes. And so we shouldn't be trying to, we shouldn't be breaking as much as we used to, especially as sort of we, we grow up as a, as a community. So my talk is mostly targeted at the people who are writing and maintaining libraries. But I know since there's a lot of people who just develop applications out there, um, I have some advice for you guys. And that is, hold us library maintainers accountable. If we break you, in, if we break you somehow, if we make a breaking change, open a GitHub issue. File, let us know that, that we broke you, because that's the only feedback we get is when, when people complain. 
And this applies for major version bumps. Going from 2.x to 3.0 um, doesn't always mean that you should be able to break all your users. So if you got broken and it's really painful, you should let, your, uh, you should let the library maintainer know that, hey, uh, maybe you didn't need to do this. Okay, so for the library maintainers out there, let's talk about how we can not break users and make people angry. Change, avoiding change is always better than mitigating change. Obviously, um, if we didn't change anything, everything would be awesome, but we have to change stuff. So mitigating change will do. Let's talk about some change mitigation strategies. Um, the first strategy we're going to talk about is compatibility adapters. So um, when, you're, when you're changing stuff in an API and you have to make a breaking change, one thing to consider to make your life easier and to make your users' lives easier is to write a compatibility adapter around that. Basically, that has, the, has a couple of pros. The first one is it basically isolates change from the user, so the user doesn't have any, any, anything to change, or hopefully nothing. And the other benefit for you is that you only have to write this once, so it's not that big of a deal, um, because that old API is not going to change, um, and all you have to do is map the old stuff to the new stuff. So if you can isolate that from your users, that would be great. This is an example of a compatibility adapter in the red carpet gem. Uh, red carpet's a markdown library that basically renders markdown to HTML. It's, uh, it's a compat library that basically translates the old API to the new format in the, the next major version. It's only 74 lines of code. I think there's only been two changes in over two years. So it's not really a big issue to maintain. But you're obviously going to say, it's a maintenance burden. And I'm going to say no, and I'm going to show you another example. Um, and this is the RubyGems source index file from RubyGems 1.3. Um, the RubyGems 1.3 source index file is basically this magical thing that lets you access all the gem specs on your system. And um, this thing went away a while ago, went away over probably over six years ago. Um, and we're in RubyGems 2. Point something right now. But um, one thing you can do is you can actually take this file verbatim and pull it into RubyGems 2.x and just require it, and it will work with zero changes. So there is literally zero maintenance cost to maintaining this file. So in other words, if you can do it, you should have compatibility adapters if you want to make a breaking change to your API. That's the first thing you should consider. If you can't do that, the next step is ethical deprecation. And I say ethical deprecation, and this is important, this is probably the most important slide in my talk, um, a lot of people sort of misunderstand what deprecation means and think it means something else, including library maintainers and application developers. And um, this is what I want to say is deprecation does not equal deletion. In fact, the definition of deprecate has no concept of removal in it. It says dislike, um, abhor, um, detest, despise. You can hate it. But it doesn't say you're getting rid of it. And basically, what we have to do is we have to live in harmony with our deprecated brothers and sisters. <laughs> so this is about tolerance. So what's a good example of deprecation? Um, this is uh, Java. Thread.stop has this method. There's this method in Java, thread.stop. This is uh, the Java 1.3 docs. And I think it was deprecated before Java 1.3. But uh, basically, it, is, it has been deprecated for a while. Java 1.8, still there, thread.stop, still around, hasn't, been, hasn't gone anywhere. That's been over 10 years now since 1.3. Five major versions, hasn't gone anywhere, still around. That's a good way to deprecate stuff. Doesn't mean you should use it, but if you wrote code in 99, you're, you can know that it's still going to work today. So what are some ways we can ethically deprecate things? Tip number one is always have a good technical reason to deprecate. And I, I mean technical, not aesthetic. So if you just don't like the, the look of a method, that's not a good reason to deprecate something. Number two is always have a replacement API. Because if you don't have a replacement, effectively what you're doing is not deprecation, but just feature removal. And that's not quite the same thing. So something you should try to be like is thread.stop. Thread.stop basically, and I don't know if you can read this, and it doesn't really matter what it says, but basically it says, there's a race condition there. Don't use this. Use condition variables instead. So they provide a really good technical reason why you should not use this method. Um, and they also provide a good alternate API. Not, in this case, it's not an API, but it's just a different way to do things. 
Be like stir CPY. Stir CPY is uh, a C method that copies strings. This isn't the ANSI C uh, runtime. This is actually an MSDN's version of the C runtime. Um, but, but Microsoft decided that they would deprecate this method for good reason. One of them is that it has a buffer overflow. It's, it's very common to have buffer overflows when you don't use stir CPY properly. So they recommend an alternate API, which is stir CPY underscore S. Again, this is a Microsoft specific thing, but it's basically a safe way to copy strings. They have this better implementation. Something you shouldn't be like is FS exists. FS exists, this is in uh, Node.js.12, it's in IOJS. It hasn't really been in the latest release of Node, but it's in IOJS. And basically what they decide to do is deprecate uh, the way to check if a path exists. And their reasoning is that it's an anti-pattern and you should never have to check if a file exists, which is not a technical reason. It's some kind of idiomatic, uh, idealistic view of, of how you should be doing programming stuff. There's no reason provided. There's no replacement API. They don't tell you how you should check a file exists. According to IOJS, you should not need to know if a file exists. So that's not a good reason. So um, on the plus side, you don't have to maintain deprecated code, which is awesome because you don't have to do anything about it. That's part of the contract of deprecating code. And that's, that is what deprecation should mean, is that I'm telling you, I'm not going to touch this code ever again. What you get today is what you're going to get in, in 10 years from now. Um, but on that note, because you're not maintaining it, there's no need to delete it. So a lot of us feel warm and fuzzy when we see diffs that show minus lines of code. And we like to feel warm and fuzzy, so we like to delete code. But when you're weighing deleting code with breaking a bunch of users, you should always choose the don't break the user side. Um, and this applies to major versions again. So just because you bumped a major version doesn't mean you can now just do spring cleaning and throw everything away. So semantic versioning, uh, yet another way to sort of deal with change. Semantic versioning is sort of a way to describe your library's version. Um, basically, it's you'd say you have a major version, you have a minor version, you have a patch. There's, these are some examples of versions. Um, Sember is a great tool. You can use Sember to describe your library. You should use Sember to describe your library, but you should not use Sember as an excuse to break users, because that's not cool. Um, and basically, what I'm saying is major versions should still be a last resort for your library. You shouldn't just say, OK, I can use Sember, and I can just say I'm making a major version bump, and now I have the, I have the uh, carte blanche to just break everybody. What you should be doing is using Sember to communicate those breaking changes in the rare cases that they do happen. You don't go the other way around and just decide to break people and then say, oh, I'm going to use Sember as my, as my excuse for doing this. Um, because then you end up with the gem file lock issue where, where major versions just change all the time and people don't know what it means. You're sort of diluting the meaning of what it means to change a major version at that point. So um, yeah, use, break, use Sember to communicate those breaking changes, not to break people. So we dealt with mitigating changes, and mitigating changes always leads to some kind of headache there dealing with old code. Let's try to avoid change in the first place. So let's talk about change avoidance strategies. OK, so all you have to do is avoid breaking changes. Sounds easy? Um, no. OK, so let's get some tips on avoiding breaking changes. Number one is um, upfront design always yields a more stable API. And this is asterisk, asterisk in my experience. I've had good luck using uh, libraries that had design up front or even writing libraries when I did the design up front. Um, that's you know, sort of been my experience. I highly recommend it. So let's look at how you can do that. A couple of ways you can make a domain model. You can make a class diagram. You can make an ER diagram. Basically, what I'm saying here is whiteboard it somehow. Go through the process of conceptualizing this, this design. Think about how the components are interacting. What you're doing here is you're validating that the model is, that, that, your, that your concept of, of this design is, is valid. And you're, you're making sure that it's going to work when you start implementing things. Uh, it, it just gives you an opportunity to think about your design before you actually start painting yourself into a corner that you're not going to like. So this is um, a domain model of Yard, a library that I wrote back in 2007. And this is uh, what I drew on my whiteboard when I was thinking through what I wanted to do. 
And this is actually part of the repo in the very first tag. So if you go back to the very first tag in GitHub, you can actually find this thing and look through it. Um, and basically, I spent a day or two thinking through the problem, drawing it out crappily on a whiteboard. And I came up with a design that I was happy with. And in doing so, I was validating the model, and I was validating that, that what, if I liked the architecture. And I came to something that I liked, and um, I guess it, I liked it, because, and I guess it worked, because eight years later, that same architecture still exists. Um, pretty much everything in that initial image still exists in some form. These are the docs for Yard right now. Um, you'll see that most of those things are still there if you look through. Um, I, I, like, I like ER diagrams, I like class diagrams, I like uh, domain models, I've had a lot of experience using them. I know that it's not for everybody. I love talking about it, so if you have questions about how to do it, I love to talk about it. I don't have enough time to talk about it here, but catch me after the talk and I'll talk your ear off about all that stuff. So if, if all that stuff daunts you, you can always do readme-driven development, which is another way you can do it. It's a, a much lighter weight format. Basically what you're doing is you're sketching out your API in readme form. So what you're doing is you're starting from the user experience and you're working backwards to the implementation. This is an example of a readme-driven development uh, library. It's Golem. It's written by Tom Preston Warner, the guy who coined the phrase. And basically, um, you're doing the same thing of, cons uh, of, of validating your, your design by thinking it through, except instead of thinking it through on a whiteboard, you're thinking it through on a computer screen in a markdown file. And so you're talking about how the user should use it, what they should expect, um, how, what, what's going to happen afterwards, et cetera, et cetera. It's a less formal process than class diagrams, but it's equally helpful, especially for small libraries. So if, you, if you're writing a small library, I highly recommend at least using readme-driven development. Finally, everything as a contract. Um, if you think about each API decision that you make as a contract that you can't break with yourself, um, it changes the way that you de develop and design things. So if you ask yourself, will I be comfortable with this API decision in five years? Um, it, it, sounds, it sounds really daunting um, to make that decision, but if, if you can't trust yourself with a, a decision that you're making today, um, why, would, why would another user trust you to depend all their code on, on the decision that you're making today? So if, if, you can't, if you can't be comfortable with that decision, then maybe don't make it public, right? Or maybe redesign it until you are comfortable with that decision and you can actually get behind it and say, I think this is the right thing to do and I think this is the right thing to do, not just today, but tomorrow and the day after. And you're going to say five years is a long time, and I'm going to say no. And to illustrate that, we're going to play this game called Things That Were Designed More Than Five Years Ago and Still Work Today. <laughs> so first one is Cron. Cron was designed a really, really long time ago. I probably wasn't alive. Um, and uh, it really hasn't changed much. You can still use the same Cron that, uh, um, configuration that you were using back in 99. It actually hasn't changed in the source since 99. So that, that one is a really good example. The next one is the Linux kernel, and this is a really good example because there are literally millions of, of machines relying on the stability, not only performance-wise, but API-wise, of the Linux kernel. And the Linux kernel has a really good track record of keeping good API compatibility, and they make good decisions based on that. Um, another one, GNU and BSD make. 10-year-old uh, make files still work. There are still 10-year-old make files, 20-year-old make files around there. Uh, that, that work and, and actually to to uh, do some I was doing some research and I came across this tweet where basically someone said they found a 20 year old make file a 20 year old C program they wrote that did some diagramming stuff with X11 and that's a Linux um, Linux sort of windowing toolkit library and they were able to resurrect this old C program compile it make two two make file changes one C source file change and they were able to compile this 20 year old program and have it working on new software. That's, that's actually not more than not bad. That's actually really impressive. And keep in mind that he probably didn't vendor GCC, make, and X11 into his library, which means he was compiling 20-year-old code against 20 years of changes in GCC, make, and X11, which is actually pretty impressive if you think about it. So the question to you guys is, will your non-trivial program be able to do this in 20 years? You probably wrote some code this week, maybe last week. Think about your Ruby code that you wrote this week. Do you think it's going to run in 2035? 
What about 10 years from now? What about just five? So I gave a bunch of tips um, specifically, but let's talk about some general lessons that you can take away from this. The first one is design for the future. Requirements always change, and we're not going to get everything right. But just because requirements always change doesn't mean we should throw our hands up in the air and say, screw it, I'm not going to get it right. I'm not going to try. If we attempt to anticipate change and we do get it right, we will avoid making those, those we will avoid having to make those breaking changes that we won't like. Um, so always design for the future and try to anticipate and try to think about what will happen. Um, you're not going to get it right. I definitely made mistakes, but it helps, um, it helps and it yields better design when you do that. The second one is think about your users. Your users are always more important than your code. It's why your library exists. It's why people are using your code. It's, um, it's, it's the lifeblood of your library. So um, if you have the choice between making your users' lives unhappy or making this code that doesn't breathe, live, or think unhappy, you should choose the side of making your code unhappy um, because it doesn't care. And that actually translates to making your, your own life a little unhappy which leads me to my third lesson, which is own your own mistakes. And I've definitely made mistakes before when I was writing libraries. Um, but the important part is that now we're grown-up, we're grown-ups, and we have to be more responsible. And just because you made a mistake in your in your library and you wanted to break something, that's not an excuse to pass that mistake off onto your users. Effectively, every time you break an API, what you're saying is, I don't want to deal with the, the mistake I made. I'm going to make you own that mistake, user. And that's not really a responsible way to look at design. So I wanted to end this talk with a quote that says, um, way, too many, way too many projects seem to think that code is more important than the user. And they break things left and right, and they don't apologize for it because they feel that they are fixing it and doing the right thing. And uh, Linus Torvald said that in an interview, um, creator of the Linux kernel. And I think that that's really apt to this talk. Um, and so uh, I'm going to end it with that. But before I do, the company that I actually work for is Amazon Web Services, if you caught that. Um, I'm really thankful for them sending me here. I'm also thankful for Ruby Fusa for letting me talk. Um, Cape Town is really awesome. And it's my first time out here, so hopefully um, it's been fun so far. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you. And you can follow me on Twitter, uh, GitHub, and that's my blog at the bottom.